Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll move on this listener right now in your gentle, loving, powerful, and merciful way as they listen to this message from All Nations Church in Tallahassee. Amen. All right, John chapter 14, beginning in verse 12. I want to talk to you a little bit today about the fact that so often we allow circumstances, situations, even the enemy to mold us to change us, to transform us, and divert us from the perfect will and plan of God for our lives. You know, when we uh, read the words of Jesus, and we're going to read them in just a moment, we have to recognize that he has a mandate for every one of us who call him our Lord and Savior. And that mandate is to replicate, to do the things that he did through the power of the Spirit of God. If you're uncertain about how the Holy Spirit works, join me Wednesday night at 7 o'clock right across the hall in the fellowship hall as I'm teaching a class on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It will benefit you. So look at John 14, beginning in verse 12. These are the words of Jesus. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works. Would you unlide those two words in your Bible? Greater works. Greater works, greater works than these will he do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. We know the helper he's talking about is the Holy Spirit. The Greek word is paraclete. It can be translated so many different ways. Helper, teacher, comforter, guide, the spirit of truth. We can talk about him as our advocate, as our intercessor, as our defense. And on and on that word can be translated so many ways because it shows the dynamic personality of the Holy Spirit of God. And when we are operating within the realm of the Holy Spirit of God and he's flowing through us, then greater works can occur. Listen, it doesn't happen through our own power or ability. It doesn't happen because of our education and intellect. It doesn't happen because our position, our title, our wealth, or lack thereof. It only happens when we're operating in the power of the Spirit of God. And if you and I will come to the point where we recognize this is what Jesus said we should be doing, then I believe we will see sick healed, demonics delivered, those who are captive set free. We will see lives restored and renewed because that's what Jesus does through the Holy Spirit. He renews and he restores and he sets men and women free. See, being a Christian and having the Holy Spirit in us isn't just about us living an overcoming, victorious life, although that's certainly a part of it. It's not just about understanding he's our father, our supplier, our provider. He is our everything. Oh, that's certainly a part of it. But we also have to recognize if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, he will put opportunities in front of us to do greater works. And it's up to us then to step out in faith and do what he's asked us to do. I had a testimony this week about a lady who was at Shands for an appointment. And while she was waiting in the waiting room, she saw another lady crying. And the Spirit of God gave her boldness. She went over and she asked if she'd pray for her. And God touched both of them through that instance. Listen, when we are obedient to the Spirit of God, he uses us to show his power, to reveal his grace, to show his mercy, and to prove again in the hearts and minds of men and women that our God is yet alive, he is still powerful, he's still on the throne, he is not defeated, he has overcome the enemy, death, hell, and the grave have bowed at his feet because Jesus has overcome. We need to understand that Command is greater works. Greater works. So I pray today that God fill every one of us with such supernatural faith that when we leave this building, we are attuned to, listening for, watching for the opportunity to touch somebody else's life. You see, we believe in praying for the sick, and we do it here, and we'll do it today. We believe in praying for the demonic to be set free, and we'll we'll do that. We understand all that, but it's not meant to be contained in the church. It's meant to happen out there in a lost and a dying world. 
Look at Luke chapter 13. I'm going to read verses 10 through 13. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. 18 years. 18 years. And was bent over. The word bent is an adverb. It means a strong indication or disposition. Completely overcome, doubled over. Picture that in your mind. This woman, all she could see was her feet because of the infirmity that was on her. She couldn't look up. All she could see was what was directly in front of her feet. And this had been that way for 18 years. I come to tell somebody today, you've carried that stuff long enough. You've dealt with it long enough. Today is the day that you're going to break that off to the power of the Spirit of God. And what you carried in, you're not going to carry out because God is still God. The Holy Spirit is still real. And it is your time to see that broken. It's your time to see healing. It's your time to find restoration. It's your time to stop looking at your feet and begin looking at the heavens. It's time to begin praising and honoring, glorifying him for what he's doing in your life. When we read this story, it says she was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. She had no power to correct what was wrong with her. It didn't matter what she thought. It didn't matter what she said. It didn't matter what she did. She had no power to change her circumstance. There are some of you, perhaps even online today, you feel that way. You feel powerless. You feel bound. You feel captive. There is no way you can ever free yourself or help yourself. But I've come to tell you this morning, there is still a Savior. His name is Jesus. There is still a Deliverer. There is still one that sets the captive free. There is still one who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you could ask or think. It's time to stop looking down and begin lifting up and begin giving him praise because of what he is about to do in your life. What he's about to accomplish. Let's read the rest of that. When Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. He said, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. But notice in the scripture, she didn't straighten up. She was still bent over. And then he laid his hands on her. Read verse 13. He laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. It was by the power of the word and the power of his touch that she was restored and renewed. That that demonic spirit that oppressed her for 18 years was broken off of her life and she could move forward into the grace of Jesus Christ. Come on, folks. We got to recognize we put up with way too much junk we don't need to put up with. We try to fight battles that we are not equipped to win. When we will give it to Jesus, when we call on the power of the Holy Spirit, then there is one who comes, there is one who aids, there is one who helps, there is one who breaks, there is one that heals, there is one that delivers, and he is able to do it even yet today. When we allow him that opportunity. This story, and we'll read the rest of it in a few minutes, is a story of two people. One was physically oppressed. The other was spiritually oppressed. One was crippled by a spirit of weakness and one was crippled by a spirit of legalism and bitterness. So let's look at it. Some are bent out of shape. Some are are disfigured, disformed because of suffering. It tells us very clearly in Luke chapter 10 or 13, the verses that we have just read, the woman had a spirit of infirmity for 13 years. Where was Jesus? He was in the synagogue. He was teaching grace and mercy and truth. He was still trying to reach the Jews, even though the opposition against him was growing stronger and stronger and stronger every day. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees were all trying to find a way to kill him because he was confronting the falsehood of their religion. The woman had been crippled for 18 years. Life was difficult. It's interesting that the gospel of Luke is written by Luke, who, as you know, was a physician, a doctor. And Luke uses a word in this passage when he uses, when he talks about the spirit of infirmity, 
And he uses a word that says, that means weakness. It doesn't mean illness. It doesn't mean disease. It doesn't mean injury. It means weakness. And her weakness was incurred. Her weakness happened. Her weakness stayed with her because of the oppression of a demonic spirit, because of a demonic influence. The cause of her malady was an evil spirit. If you read all four of the Gospels, you'll find 26 recorded miracles that Jesus did in the three and a half years of his ministry. Seven of those miracles were attributed to demonic influence. What am I saying to you this morning? I'm saying there are sometimes we need to look at the source. There are times we need to pray, God, would you activate within me that spirit of discernment so I can tell what's motivating what's happening in my life. And if it's a demonic spirit, then we have the opportunity by the power of God to curse that thing, command it to go, and in Jesus' name, it has to flee. Isn't that what he said? If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So if we ask in his name to set people free, he will do it. I've come to tell you, you don't have to carry that any longer. You don't have to be bound, sick, oppressed. There is a healing Jesus, a delivering Jesus who desires to set you free. Now, I want you to notice this woman was not demon-possessed. She was oppressed. The demon was oppressing her. I mean, you can almost see his hand pushing her down and not allowing her to stand up straight. That was the power and the influence of this demonic spirit over this woman. And when we read the scripture and then compare this with other scriptures, when Jesus cast out demons, when you read every instance, you'll find he never once laid hands on a person. He didn't even speak to the person. He spoke to the demon spirit. But in this instance, he spoke to the woman. And then he laid hands on her. What does it tell us? It tells us she was oppressed, not possessed. It's a whole different thing. And I've come to tell you, there's a lot of believers who are oppressed by the enemy. His hand is pushing you down. You feel like you'll never get out of the situation you're in. You don't know what to, let me give you a personal story. It was, I believe, I, uh, last year in January, I came down with something in my lungs I just couldn't get rid of. It was affecting my sleep. I felt like I was smothering every night. My doctor did all the tests. We thought it was something wrong with my heart or my lungs. Everything came back negative. It was all good. When it came back negative, I knew what was going on. I knew there was a devil that was trying to stop, trying to oppress, and we took authority over it, and immediately I began to breathe freely again. Oh, come on, someone. You need to understand. It happens to believers, even though who, those who are full of the Holy Ghost, but if we will stand in the authority that God has given us by his Holy Spirit, that thing has to flee. That oppression has to stop. The enemy had convinced her that she would never be able to stand up straight again. She would be bent over double the entirety of her life. What did he do with that lie? He created a stronghold within her. He created a stronghold within her. Anytime we don't walk in the power of God and we let Satan get a toehold, he's going to turn it into a stronghold. That's why Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, 27, don't give place to the devil. But folks, we need to hear that. If you're watching stuff, if you're listening with stuff, if you're going places, if you're hanging out with the wrong folks, what's happening? You're giving place to the devil. You're giving him a toehold in your life. And that toehold will turn to a stronghold if you don't take authority over it and put him back where he belongs, which is under your feet. We got to understand that. The Passion Translation translates Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 this way. But don't let the passion of your emotions lead you to sin. I got to stop right there. Do you have any idea how many Christians have let the passion of their emotions lead them to sin? They get mad at the preacher. They get mad at the church. They get mad at some believer in what they said. They're out the door. They turn their back on God. They say, this isn't going to work. Or this is what usually happens. They find another group of disgruntled believers and they join with them. And then they say, why doesn't our church grow? Well, because you're on the wrong foundation. You got to get the junk out of your heart before God can do something. And as long as you're harboring bitterness, envy, selfishness, anger, 
you'll never see God do anything in your life. He goes on to say, don't let anger control you or be fuel for revenge, not even a day. Verse 27, don't give the slanderous accuser, the devil, an opportunity to manipulate you. I like that. That was the message translation. Don't let the devil manipulate you. Don't let him convince you you can't when Jesus says you can. Don't let him convince you that you can't stand up, you can't lift up your eyes, you can't overcome what you're dealing with when Jesus says you can. Why do we allow it? Because we're powerless. Like this lady, we're powerless against the Spirit. And we will always be powerless against it until we stand on the Word of God, declare His Word to be true, and rebuke Him in Jesus' name. Oh, come on, folks. This is a real thing happening around us. Every day, you can walk up and down the streets of Tallahassee, and you will encounter demon-possessed, demon-oppressed people. The devil is working really, really hard to tear up our society. And it's not just Tallahassee, it's around the nation and around the world. You know, Pastor Leo, there was a time when the American church demon possession thought demon possession only occurred in places like Africa. But I've got news for you. It's right here. It's on our streets. It's all around us. Some even walk through the door to bring disruption to the things of God. But I've come to tell you this morning, there is no demon welcome in this place. We have power, we have authority, and we will cause them to flee in Jesus' name. The enemy tries to build strongholds, tell you you can't when you can. You can't stand up, you can't lift your eyes, you're powerless against this thing. Now let me meddle a little bit. I just can't stop drinking. I've been drinking for 40 years. I need that alcohol. Baloney! You need the Holy Ghost. And when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, he'll break that addiction off your life. You say, Albert, you don't know what they did to me. It hurt me so badly. I've never recovered from that instance, and now I'm bitter because of it. Baloney! You need to forgive and then let God renew your life. You say, forgive? I can't forgive. Preacher, you don't know what they did. You don't understand. There's no way I can do that. Yes, you can by the power of the Spirit of God. The story is told about, you ever been to the circus? You see those big old huge 2,000 pound elephants tied to a little wooden stake and they never move? Did you ever wonder why? Surely that elephant has enough power to pull the stake out of the ground and go where it wants to go. Did you ever think about that? Let me tell you why it doesn't. Because when that elephant is a baby, they tie it to a stake that's driven five or six foot in the ground. And when it's a baby, it tries to pull against it. It tries to pull it up. It tries to get away until finally it realizes it can't escape the stake. So that carries with it through life so that when it's an adult and it can destroy that stake, it still thinks, I can't escape the stake. Some of you are in that same place. You think there's no way I can get past this. You're always looking back. Your life is behind you. I've come to tell you this morning, Jesus forgives and heals and renews your past and he wants you to look forward and he wants you to look up and he wants you to know there's a plan for you. Stop being tied to a stake from yesterday. Let God set you free. There are some things that do have power to bind, that do have power to misshape us. But I've come to tell you, they're really not powerful at all. We just give them that opportunity. And I'm challenging you this morning to absolutely stand on your two feet and declare, Satan, you're a liar, you're a deceiver, you're a cruise accuser of the brethren, but I've got news for you. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world, that he overcame, we overcome him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. Oh, somebody, would you give him praise today? Look at that story. Jesus spoke to her, but she didn't straighten up. But when he touched her, then she straightened up. I believe that in this room this morning, God is going to touch some people. 
Sickness and disease will be overcome. Sorrow and sadness will pass away. Worry and anxiety and pain. A wounded spirit will no longer be who you are. Because we're going to pull that stake up this morning. When I read this story, I remember two things. Number one, Jesus sees us. It says he saw her and called her to him. He saw her and called her to him. And then he saw what was happening in her life. Let me rephrase it this way. He sees us and he sees the things we're hiding from everybody else. And his desire is to break that stronghold, to break that chain in and over our lives. He's calling you today. He's calling you because he has an answer. He has a way out. He has power to give you freedom today. And when he touches you, oh, hear me. When he touches you, you're going to straighten up. You're going to straighten up. You know, I know some people who before they got saved, they were so crooked, you'd have to screw them in the ground when they died. But when God touched them, they straightened up. Oh, come on. Paul said in Ephesians 4, if you stole, steal no more. If bad communication come out of your mouth, stop it and begin God, giving God glory, honor, and praise. Come on, somebody. When he touches you, you straighten up. Some of you need to hear that. You say, well, I, 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 don't, have, I, I don't have a choice. I, I, I have to live with that person. I've said this before. I'll say it again. If you love them, then get married and get out of sin. Because living together, folks, is a stronghold. It's a tie that will bind you and never allow you to know the freedom and the power that's in Jesus' name. You say, will you marry us? Yeah, after you go through a six-week premarital course, I will. And the first thing I'll tell you is, you go home and live with your mama and stop living with him. Or you go home and live with your mama and stop living with her for the next six weeks. You got to break it in order to be free. The second person in the story is the leader of the synagogue. Look at it, verses 14 through 16 of Luke 13. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, and he said to the crowd, There are six days in which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them not on the Sabbath. Wow. I, I can't say anything but wow. You talk about religion enslaving, that's the description right there. You came at the wrong time. You came on the wrong day. You messed up our service order. We don't do that stuff around here. You're getting way too radical. We don't want to see that on the Sabbath. Do it Sunday through Friday. We'll all be okay, but don't do it on the Sabbath. Verse 13, then the Lord, speaking of Jesus, answered him, said, hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it, for 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? What an analogy. If you're going to take care of your livestock, why wouldn't God take care of you? That's what he's saying. If you're concerned about the welfare of that livestock, God is concerned about your welfare as well. He wants to liberate and set. He doesn't care what day it is. I crack up when people tell me, I got to get to church so God can touch me. Listen, God can touch you in your living room. God can touch you in your bedroom. God can touch you going down the road. He can touch you at work. He is not limited by your physical surroundings. He's only limited by your mindset. And it's time to let him move in your life, wherever you may be. Wherever you may be. I want to read those verses 15 and 16 from the message. It says, but Jesus shot back. You frauds, every Sabbath, every one of you regularly enties your cow or donkey from a stall, leads it out for water and thinks nothing of it. So why isn't it all right for me to untie this daughter of Abraham and lead her from the stall where Satan has had her for 18 years? Wow, what a powerful word. 
See, when we read this passage, we realize several things. Number one, religion inverts priorities. Religion causes us to treat possessions, property, titles, positions, better than we treat people. You know one thing that always concerns me? When someone comes in and the first words out of their mouth is, I'm a prophet, I'm an evangelist, I'm an apostle. You know what I want to say? Well, tell me about your works. You're an apostle, tell me about the churches you've started and planted. You're an evangelist, tell me about the people you brought into the kingdom of God. You're a prophet, tell me how you've encouraged and edified those around you. And every single time, they're mute, they're silent. They have no answer for that because all they want is a title. I've come to tell you, titles belong nowhere in the kingdom of God. People ask me, what do you call me? My name is Steve, and I'm okay with that. I had it for 66 years. I have no problem with that. But you're a pastor. You should be Pastor Dow. I don't care what you call me. What, just call me for dinner. I don't care. Whatever makes you comfortable and happy, whatever your background dictates, but I will never say to you, you've got to call me this name, this title. I just fill an office, the office of pastor and teacher. Some are bent out of shape by religion. Religion always inverts our priorities. Listen, if we would put as much time into reaching the lost, I'm going to meddle again, and as much money into reaching the lost as we do to save the puppies and save the kitties and save the whales and save that microcosm that there's only one in the entire universe. Do you understand how the world distracts you from what is important? I hate that commercial when it comes on TV about, oh, save these poor dogs. They have no shelter. I wouldn't give those folks a penny. Well, you must hate dogs. No, I actually really like dogs. And I have one. But my dog is not a human being. My dog doesn't have a soul. My dog doesn't have a destiny that's either heaven or hell. Why wouldn't I spend my time, my effort, my energy, my money into reaching those who do rather than trying to manipulate your heart to pull you into something so silly Yeah, I'm going to say something so silly and statistic. Origin and Satan is saving dogs and cats and whales. Ridiculous. Oh, I may as well go and tell you. All dogs don't go to heaven. When they're dead, they're dead. You bury them, they're not coming back to life. You're not going to see them when you get to heaven. Do you still love me? And cats? Oh, don't get me started on cats. Cats have no reason to live. (laughs) Just one man's opinion. That's all it is. Religious leaders in Jesus' day found every loophole they could find in the law to do what they wanted to do. And unfortunately, it's just the same today. Happens every day. People are more concerned about enforcing and following the rules than living in a joyful relationship with Jesus. Can I tell you, when you're in love with him and you're filled with the Holy Ghost, it's not a matter of keeping the rules. It's a matter of pleasing the Father and you're gonna do what pleases him, not what man says you have to do. It's a wonderful thing when God does that. Every time the Spirit begins to move, no matter where we've pastored, it happens every single time. And you understand the Spirit's moving in a dynamic way in this church. Started the last Sunday of December, and it continues. It's been wonderful. People are saved. People are healed. People are delivered. They're filled with the Holy Ghost. Their lives are revolutionized. Not because of me, but because of what God has done. It's an amazing thing. But every time God begins to move, old sour Sally, or old critical Chris stands up and says, you better be careful. This might get out of hand. You're going to have some wildfire. I never worry about, you know why? 
because there's always enough people to pour cold water on it. It never happens. I hope that's not you. I hope that's not you. They're not appointed. They're self-appointed. They're there to make sure that it doesn't get out of control. You know what I pray? I pray for them. I pray, God, would you wreck their lives? God, would you invade their little... Would you invade their little pea brain and bring them to a place where the Spirit of God does a revolutionizing work in their life and they walk out changed, full of joy, walking in peace, understanding the grace of God and the power of the Holy Ghost moves through them. Not criticizing and complaining. We don't do that around here. That didn't fit with our service order. I don't know why the pastor allows that. You want to tell you why? Because I'm concerned, more concerned about pleasing God than I am pleasing you. That's the bottom line. People have come and gone. It will continue to happen. They'll come in. They'll say, I love it. See, there's a lot of people who want to get close enough to the Holy Ghost to get warm. They want to feel good. They want the warm fuzzies going on inside of them. But they will never get close enough to be set on fire. And the Spirit of God is looking for people who will say, burn me up, revolutionize me, set me on fire, do something in me that changes me. Don't just make me comfortable. Make me dangerous. Make me dangerous. Too many hold on to traditionalism. Jesus even talked about it in Mark chapter 7, verse 8. He said, you lay aside the commands of God and uphold the traditions of men. Describes so many in the church world today. Tom, would you come back? Matthew chapter 22, I'm closing. Verse 37 through 40, Jesus said, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You want to see God do something in your life? Obey these two commands. Love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. You can read Deuteronomy, Exodus, Numbers. You can see the requirements of the law as Moses prescribed them in those books. But I've got news for you. The law was never meant to entrap or to enslave. The law was meant to reveal our weakness and to bring us to Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said in Galatians 3.24, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Love God, love your neighbor, open your heart to the power and the presence of the Holy Ghost and let him do what he wants to do. Remember the woman? She was bent over. She was oppressed. Bent over means to have a strong inclination or disposition. That means she had accepted her infirmity, her weakness, and wasn't going to do anything about it. She came to synagogue to worship in her tradition. What she didn't know is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, whose name is Jesus, would be teaching that day. And when he saw her, he called to her. He said, come on up here. Come on up here. And when she responded and came towards him, he said, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. And then he laid his hands on her and she straightened up. Stand with me across this room today. Elders and deacons, I need you now. If you're in this room this morning. You've been trying to follow rules, rituals, traditions. And it hadn't worked for you. You're in this room today and you're tired of being sick. You're tired of being oppressed. You're tired of being bound because it isn't working for you. 
What we're going to do this morning is these elders and deacons are going to lay hands on you and pray for you. I'm going to anoint you with oil. And I believe that when I believe that when the touch of God falls on your life, the oppression is broken. The addiction is broken. The habit is broken. The sickness, disease, infirmity have to flee. Why? Because we ask in Jesus' name. And anything you ask in my name, he said, I will do. So I'm talking to you this morning. If you're here and you need God to touch your life in any area, in any way, step out and come as Tom begins to sing. Stand in front of our elders and deacons. They're going to pray over you and pray for you. I'm going to anoint you with oil. Come on, don't wait. Hurry, hurry, hurry. The Spirit of God is in this place. He's moving in this room this morning. It's time for you to find the victory, deliverance, hope, and help in Jesus' name. Some of you need to slide down this way. Some of the elders and deacons that are over here to my right, uh, slide on down. There's plenty of them over here to pray with you and to pray for you. You don't need to stand in line. Find one that's not there and pray for them, all right? Find one that now has somebody in front of them and let them pray for you. Hallelujah. 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 Elders and deacons, right now, I'm going to move from the left to the right, and I'm going to anoint with oil. You're going to pray over them, and Jesus is going to touch them. He's going to do a powerful and a mighty work in their lives. Listen to me. Don't leave until I anoint you with oil. It's very important that you stay and stand until I anoint you with oil. Sing it out, Tom. You made it to the end of the message, and now what? Is God leading you to make a change? Are you needing a good church home where you can grow and help others grow as you fulfill your part in the body of Christ? Then we invite you to join us at All Nations Church on Sharer Road in Tallahassee, a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. Our Sunday morning service is at 1030 and Wednesday night service at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For more information, visit our website, allnationstallahassee.com.